Hi, my name is Sebastian Budgen. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you would already be familiar with. So I wanted just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you also probably be familiar with. It's published by Brill Academic Press, and then all the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations, of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature in, the, in uh, making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, again, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it will be uh, well, we it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive, for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build the historical material as a project. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Panagiotis Sotiris. I am a member of the editorial board of the Historical Materialism Journal, and I'd like to welcome you to this panel for Historical Materialism Online 2020. This panel is dedicated to a very important collective volume that has been uh, out in the Historical Materialism book series. It is already out for about a year in the uh, Brill series, but uh, relatively soon it is also going to be out in the Haymarket uh, edition of the book series, which means it's also very, very relatively cheap and easy uh, to obtain. This is a collective volume uh, edited by Francesca Antonini, Aaron Bernstein, Lorenzo Fusaro, and Robert Jackson. Uh, and uh, I would like to say from the beginning that it's it's, it's, it's one of the most important recent contributions to Gramsci and philology. Uh, so it's, I'm really, really happy to be able to do this uh, book launch, but also do search this book, uh, do try to obtain it and read it. Uh, because this is also a way to, uh, you know, support the historical materialism book, uh, historical materialism book series and the historical materialism project in general. And in a certain way, this project is about being able to issue out books. Uh, like like these. Uh, this uh, panel is going to be organized in the uh, in the following way. We have uh, uh, three of the editors, uh, Francesca, Lorenzo, and Robert, and also two of the contributors, uh, Peter and Anne. And uh, they will and we will start with some uh, short, relatively short presentations from their part. And then there's going to be, we hope to have enough time for discussion. Uh, please note that the, because you are seeing this uh, panel at the at a YouTube uh, stream, uh, use the YouTube chat to post your uh, questions there or your comments. All these are going to be relayed to us and then going to be uh, answered or commented upon by the uh, presenters. And without uh, further ado, I give the floor to 
uh, Lorenzo Fusaro, who's going to be the first uh, speaker. Lorenzo has a PhD in international political economy from King's College London and is currently an associate professor at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico, where he teaches political economy and conducts research on a project titled Great Powers, Revolutions and Even Development and the Making of the World Order. His publications include uh, the book Why China is Different, he examined the revolutions and the rise of the contender states, uh, the prison notebooks, the Macat Library, this is the second, and Crisis and Hegemonic Transition from Gramsci's Quaderni to the Contemporary World Economy, which is a title that's been out in the historical uh, materialist book series. So, Lorenzo, you have the virtual floor. Uh, many thanks and many thanks to the organizers uh, to, to organize this, uh, given also the uh, specific and difficult uh, uh, circumstances. Also, many thanks to Anne and Peter to join Francesca, Rob and myself in this uh, uh, roundtable. And I wish also to underline that also Aaron Bernstein, uh, who is not here with us today uh, online, he also contributed importantly to uh, to this project. Um, as the first speaker, I will say something about the genesis um, of this book. And in doing so, I'd like to say something about the beginnings and what actually brought us together. And then I wish to say something uh, about the conference we organized uh, in 2015, a conference that was that served as the basis for the uh, present book. And finally, I'd like to say just a few words on the structure of uh, our uh, book. So actually, it was uh, Rob who brought us together at the end of 2013 and beginning of 2014. And this is, it is important also to uh, remind and to mention uh, different Gramscian initiatives, amongst which also the Gilasa summer school that uh, made it possible for different scholars uh, to uh, to meet uh, right uh, and that they fostered uh, encounters uh, which finally uh, gave us the opportunity to uh, uh, chat with uh, uh, each other um, there are mainly i would say uh, two things perhaps that we uh, had in common uh, although we come from different fields of studies and are not philologists, I think we all believed that it is uh, only through a careful return to Gramsci's uh, original writing that, that it is possible to attempt to fully grasp uh, Gramsci's uh, thought uh, and also uh, to understand the origin and the elaboration of his uh, concepts. This, I think, is particularly important uh, uh, as maybe uh, at the superficial level of analysis or at the level of appearances, you sometimes get the impression that Gramsci's ideas and concepts are contradictory. So this is maybe even something that misled some uh, authors who worked on uh, Gramsci. And we believe that, is, that it is only through careful uh, study that it is possible to attempt to comprehend uh, the interrelation or the organic connection uh, between different parts that uh, make up concepts in, uh, in Gramsci. And perhaps the other shared idea we had was that Gramsci's concepts are still uh, relevant uh, today, not just uh, theoretically, uh, for the analysis and understanding of contemporary capitalism or the contemporary world. But relatedly, we believe that Gramsci's concepts still offer relevant insights for thinking about uh, strategies able to shape uh, the present. So each of us heard about different people working on a similar uh, line or in a similar uh, direction. And this basically resulted in a call for a conference that took place in London in uh, 2015. And the conference was called uh, Past and Present Philosophy, Politics and History 
in the thought of uh, Gramsci. Through the title, uh, Past and Present, we wanted to highlight the importance of the past and the present for, for, understanding, for understanding and shaping uh, the present. Here, with a capital, with a capital P, no? underlining the dialectical uh, relation. At the margin, I wish also to uh, mention that uh, exactly on this theme, we have a, a very interesting contribution by Fabio Frosini in this very uh, volume. So going back to this conference, we had about uh, 45 scholars from 16 uh, countries uh, working within different fields of research uh, from linguistic to anthropology, geography, political economy, amongst uh, uh, others. And the book is basically a selection of different uh, contribution and it is made of uh, 25 uh, chapters. Uh, yet the different chapters are not just conference uh, proceedings. Uh, we have really, I guess, uh, very interesting and elaborated uh, contribution. And the structure of the book reflects the many Gramscian fields of research following the method I was mentioning uh, just before. Uh, and Francesca later on will elaborate a little bit more on this. And going back to the structure, uh, as I said, 25 chapters organized in eight, in eight sections. And I, will, I wish just to read out the title of the section so that, that you might get an idea. The first is called Global Gramsci and Gramscian Geographies. The second, Language and Translation. Uh, the third, Gramsci and the, Mar uh, and the Marxian legacy. The fourth, subalternity between pre-modernity and modernity. The fifth section, uh, post-colonial and, and, anthropo and anthropological approaches. The sixth, uh, culture, ideology, and religion. The seventh, historical capitalism and world history. And the eighth section, uh, uh, readings of Gramsci. So as you can see, it's a very uh, rich uh, book. I guess, and I'm happy now uh, to give, yeah, thanks Rob. I'm happy uh, to give the word uh, now later on to Francesca who will say something more about the method that we used. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Rob. And now I will give the floor to uh, Francesca Antonini. Francesca Antonini is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Lichtenberg College at Georg August Universität Göttingen in Germany. And she has had uh, previously research positions at the Université de Lyon and at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in France and the Fondazione Luigi Einaudi in Turin in Italy. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of Pavia and uh, she, another book by her, a monograph on the concepts of Caesarism and Bonapartism in Antonio Gramsci's work will uh, soon appear in the book series. Actually, it's going for, it is uh, scheduled to appear uh, in the next days entitled Caesarism and Bonapartism in Gramsci, Hegemony and the Crisis of Modernity. So, uh, Francesca, you have the floor. Thank you, Panayotis. And um, thanks also to Anne and Peter for joining us today. And the HM conference organizers for hosting us here and giving us this opportunity to present our book. Thank you very much. As Lorenz anticipated, I just want to say a few words about methodology. Uh, we discussed this issue in the introduction, so I don't go into details, not what for anyone, but I think, or we think, as editors, that the this methodological issue, methodological issue is not secondary, but rather it's a central issue in Gramscian scholarship nowadays. It's an issue that is strictly connected to the interpretations of Gramscian thought as a whole. In fact, we think that the best approach, the approach to Gramscian thought that we share is the, is the one that we could define the historical philological approach. This kind of approach um, has been, uh, let me say, established in recent years and characterize what we could find the Gramscian revival that took place in the last two decades, especially in Italy, 
but also all around the world. The most important uh, development, most important outcome of this new revival is the new uh, critical edition of Gramsci's work, which is currently in preparation in Italy. It's called Edizione Nazionale degli Scritti di Antonio Gramsci. And it comprises uh, not only his pre-prison writings, but also a new edition of the prison writings and letters and materials. And we think that this is going to be to represent the basis of the future Gramscian scholarship also in the future. Why we think that this kind of approach, this very historical and philological approach is the best one to work in Gramsci? So the reason it's simple, because of his turn, because if, of its essential incompleteness, which is due to both internal and external reasons, his way of working in prison and his, his very train of thought, if we can say so. For these reasons, we believe that it's very important to pay attention to the in-progress dimension, to the in-progress features and dialectic features of his thought, which can be catched only through uh, a close philological and textual analysis. So that means paying attention to textual variants, to the way Gramsci expresses his own thought. So it doesn't mean to just work on the Italian text, on the, the text, its original version, but it means, uh, it means rather to adopt a broader way of approaching, a new way of approaching Gramsci's text. And we think also, as Lorenzo was saying before, that this way, his approach doesn't mean to exclude, adopting this approach doesn't mean to exclude a more theoretical or contemporary oriented approaches or issues. In fact, reading Gramsci and approaching Gramsci from this philological point of view allow us to better grasp also his contemporary relevance to so, talking about politics and society and so on. And this is, briefly speaking, so the approach we adopted in the book, and we encourage all the contributors of the book to adopt this approach. Also the ones who were not very much acquainted with this approach, who do not speak Italian as their native language. And they, 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 they were very helpful, so to say, and they worked in this direction. And in this sense, it was very useful also the presence of the um, current English um, dictation edition of Gramsci's work. And in particular, I'm talking about the edition of the prison notebooks edited by Joseph Babocic, who is still in, so it's not complete yet, but it's going to represent the basis of the Gramscian philology in the English language also in the future. And I think, so we think that this kind of approach makes our volume, so to say, unique. And I would say also unparalleled from this point of view. If there are many monographs uh, now available in English which show this kind of approach, uh, books uh, written originally in English or translations of Italian books, this is, the, this is the very unique collection which shows this kind of approach. There are no other um, edited volumes which show this approach at least in the Anglophone world, and I think it's very, it's very useful. And I think, if I can add lastly, maybe his uniqueness was made possible by the fact that the most of the contributors were, or are, are still are, uh, early career researchers, and therefore scholars who belong to a new generation of Gramsci uh, scholar, scholarship, the, the group who, who are part of this new generation of Gramsci scholarship, and the four can read Gramsci's text with a fresh eye, so to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Francesca. And now I give the floor to Robert Jackson. Rob is a lecturer in politics at Manchester Metropolitan University. He has published in Science Society, the International Gramsci Journal and Gramsciana. He was co-organizer of this uh, of the conference from which uh, actually this volume came from and has also participated in the Gilaza summer schools. He's interested in the concept of mummification, the language of life and death in Gramsci, and he has uh, written chapters that have appeared in the volumes Subjectivity and the Political and Contemporary Perspective, published in 2017 by Routledge, and The Meanings of, Meanings of Violence, 
from Critical Theories of Biopolitics, uh, published in 2018, also by Routlet. Rob, you have the floor. Thanks very much. And thank you also for your kind words uh, at the beginning, Paniotis. And, uh, and like Francesca and Lorenzo, I'd like to thank the, the organizers and Peter and Anne for agreeing to, to join us here today. Um, I'd just at the outset like to mention the um, dedication of the volume to Joe Buttigieg, who Francesca mentioned, um, who sadly died in January 2019. Um, Joe was professor of English at, at Notre Dame and the editor of, as Francesca said, the published volumes of the critical edition of Gramsci's prison notebooks in English. Um, and as the editors, we really wanted to acknowledge how important Joe's work was, particularly for those of us who, um, who began our engagement with Gramsci as Anglophone readers. Um, and Joe really opened up and made possible many of our own pathways of research on Gramsci and themes. Um, on a more personal level, he also uh, shared his time and ear with those of us that were new to the field and was you know, an incredibly warm and, and generous person. Um, so Lorenzo's already explained the, the genesis of the volume, if you like, emerging from the connections established and the conversations begun at the 2015 past and present Gramsci conference in London. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen um, with you for a, a few minutes um, so that you will be able to see the, hopefully, and the poster from the conference and also the um, the cover of the, the forthcoming Haymarket edition. And um, it was certainly, the conference was certainly incredibly rich and stimulating a um, couple of days. Um, Francesca has also commented on the particular methodology that we sought to pursue across the project, namely encouraging a return to and an attentiveness towards Gramscian texts themselves. And following Giuseppe Cospito, a diachronic approach that registers the rhythm of Gramsci's thought in the course of its development. Following on from this, I now want to say a few words about what I think is a particular strength of the volume and to highlight one or two of the contributions and their contemporary resonances. The strength of the volume, and I'm talking here about the contributions rather than particularly trying to blow our own trumpets, um, is that it brings the historico-philological approach to studying Gramsci, which Francesca has just outlined, into dialogue with the extraordinarily diverse contemporary applications of Gramscian concepts in a range of intellectual fields. As Lorenzo has pointed out, these include radical and human geography, international political economy, linguistics and translation studies, anthropology and sociology, cultural studies, political philosophy and political theory, post and decolonial thought and literary theory, to name but a few. Moreover, the contributors to the volume use this movement between, between Gramscian texts and contemporary debates, both to develop new intellectual resources and to employ these to engage with issues in their own fields of inquiry. Thus, we could say that there is a productive tension, or perhaps better to say a reciprocal translation in the volume between a more philological and contextualized understanding of Gramsci's thought and the reactualization of Gramscian pathways to address live questions and debates. Through an enrichment of their conceptual toolboxes by revisiting Gramsci's texts, many of the contributors locate fertile resources to move beyond certain theoretical impasses in their respective fields. Indeed, in some cases, this productive tension reveals resources that have been overlooked by schools of thought that have in fact conceived of themselves as neo-Gramscian. I'm thinking here of Lorenzo's contribution in regard to Cox and the Italian school of IR. I'll perhaps leave it to others in today's meeting to explore the specific character of Gramsci's method and thought that has enabled it to play such a role since his death. Um, however, the fertility of revisiting Gramsci's thought, I think is evidenced in a number of the, well, in, in almost all of the uh, chapters. So I just want to take one example, uh, which is, Alex Loftus's contribution, uh, which encounters Gramsci as an historical geographical materialist. Loftus re-examines Gramsci's philosophy of praxis, finding new insights by reading this philosophy of praxis simultaneously as a spatial historicism, as a way to conceptualize the politics of space that moves beyond planetary and epochal abstractions 
in recent debates about the Anthropocene. While the contributors hail from a wide range of intellectual backgrounds, disciplines and areas of interest, the chapters, I hope, all bear signs of this productive exchange between a return to the underexplored resources of Gramsci's method and texts and the enrichment of the legacy of Gramsci's influence on contemporary fields of inquiry through this process of revisiting. Lorenzo's already mentioned a little bit this term revisiting in the title of the volume and I kind of reiterate that this by, by adding that it's important that this suggests that this is a live project and these studies represent just one moment within an ongoing discussion. And really, I hope that today will be an opportunity to continue these discussions and stimulate wider interest among those that might wish to take up these themes again in the future. So just before I hand back over to um, uh, Panayotis, um, I just want to show you uh, one more slide, which is, uh, again, I guess a, a reiteration of uh, the, the structure that Lorenzo um, outlined earlier. You can see the different parts uh, that Lorenzo was talking about in which we've gathered the different contributions within, within the book along different themes. Um, and you can also see a little bit here, some of the titles, um, Alex Loftus's chapter that I've mentioned, um, but also a rich diversity of other uh, contributions. Um, again, including many very important kind of contemporary debates, you know, just taking the second chapter by Roberto Rocco, uh, dealing with and drawing a balance sheet of different uh, discussions about attempts to theorize neoliberalism with uh, Gramsci's concept of passive revolution, and in Rocco's case, applying that to the case of, of Egypt. Um, again, Another chapter, which has a very important contemporary relevance, even more so in the last year, is Budarax's uh, analysis of the organic crisis in Thailand, which in the view of the uh, growing uh, pro-democracy and uh, anti-monarchy uh, protests in, um, in, in Thailand at the moment, I think really bears rereading in the current moment. Um, and this is only half of the volume. As you can see, there's a huge amount uh, to, to discuss and to chew over, and I hope will be food for, for many, many more debates. Um, so I think probably my time is about up. So I'm now going to hand back to Panayotis with thanks, and um, so that we can hand over to uh, Anne and Peter. Okay, thank you, Rob. And now uh, I give the floor to Peter Thomas. Peter Thomas is uh, a member also of the Editorial Board of Historical Materialism and also of the uh, Editorial Board of the Historical Materialism book series. He's a senior lecturer in politics and history at Brunel University. He's the author of The Gramscian Moment, Philosophy, Hegemony and Marxism from the Historical Materialism book series and now in, in K Market and co-editor of Encountering Althusser Politics and Materialism in Contemporary Radical Thought and in Marx's Laboratory Critical Interpretations of the uh, Gudrisse. And apart from being on the editorial board of historical materialism, he's also on the editorial board of International Gramsci Journal, uh, the board of directors of Gramsciana and the International Scientific Committee of the Gilarta Summer School. So Peter, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here today to discuss um, the book with, with everyone. Um, firstly, congratulations um, to the editors, um, not, uh, not just on the, the publication of the book, um, and I think this is an important point to highlight, but congratulations on having been able to build up and sustain and bring to fruition a very creative uh, international research network over uh, a long number of years. Um, I, I remember very well the first conversations I had with some of you when you were setting out on, on this path um, a long time ago when we were all much younger. Um, and I was very impressed to see the way that young scholars with a lot of energy uh, were reaching out, uh, building up international networks, uh, constructing the relations that are needed um, to produce an organic process of collective research. 
we saw one important moment of that come together at the um, incredibly stimulating and successful conference um, held in, in London um, some, some years ago, five years ago now. Uh, but obviously that's been a process that's continued on in the intense discussions um, with contributors to the volume over the last years. And it's wonderful to finally have the, the fruits of your labors, so to speak, in our hands. I'm not sure if I've yet seen um, a copy of the book held up. So I, I thought I might just show the, uh, the Brill uh, copy here. And uh, in particular, to give you the side profile, to give you a, a sense of this is really quite a substantial volume. This is not just one of um, the short uh, edited collections that various uh, publishers put out every now and again. Um, this is a, a significant tome of uh, scholarly work of a, a very high standard. Um, and to produce a, an edited collection of this quality uh, and this length uh, is, is uh, no simple undertaking. So many congratulations to all of you for that. I'd like to speak a little bit um, about what's particularly significant um, about this uh, collection of, of essays on Gramsci. I don't think it's, it's just another collection of essays on Gramsci. Um, there are, of course, a wide range of, of texts that are published on Gramsci every year. In recent years, there's been a revival of collected volumes on different topics and some very uh, high quality volumes. Um, but I think this volume uh, is quite special and distinctive, not only in terms of Anglophone literature, but also in terms of the international discussion. Um, so I'd like to suggest three reasons why this is a particularly a significant publication for everybody who's interested in exploring the, the riches of Gramsci's thought. Firstly, um, this volume, I think, gives us a, a real sense of a new Gramsci. And by a new Gramsci here, I'm not just referring to the way in which there are um, many uh, younger researchers presenting us with new and innovative readings of Gramsci's thought, although the volume does include um, many exciting um, young and emerging scholars in it. What I mean by a, a new uh, Gramsci um, is instead um, something more historically significant in terms of the way Gramsci's thought has been um, received and, and debated and contested um, over the last 70 years or so. So Gramsci today, as um, I'm sure we're all aware, is one of the most cited uh, authors of the 20th century. Um, each year, uh, a mass of articles and books and, and references um, to, to Gramsci are published in, in various various places. It's hard to think, in fact, of any other significant thinker of the 20th century uh, who has the range of contemporary relevance and resonance um, as, as Gramsci across an incredibly broad range of academic disciplines, but also then significantly uh, internationally. Gramsci has an appeal um, and a relevance in many areas um, of, of the world where other thinkers um, have not uh, achieved such, such prominence. But to speak about uh, a new Gramsci today, I think is also to pose the question of, well, what is it different from? What was the old Gramsci? Which Gramsci's are we discussing? I'd like to suggest, um, not entirely um, provocatively, um, that much um, of the contemporary discussion of Gramsci in the, the many thousands of articles and texts that are published each year, uh, citing his works or, or quoting his name, should be better understood as readings of a very particular type of author uh, who would be more adequately characterized as Gramsci hyphen Togliati hyphen Platone. I'm referring here um, to the distinctive author who emerged in the late 1940s and early 1950s um, due to the work of Palmiro Togliati, the leader of the Italian Communist Party at the time, and uh, Felice Platone, uh, an old collaborator of Gramsci's and, and also of Togliati. Platone and Togliati's genius, um, in many respects, it's been characterized as a sort of Operation Gramsci in a military sense by Francesco Chiarotto. Um, was to group together Gramsci's many different writings from prison and present them in a form that enabled uh, their digestion, so to speak, by the reading public, first in Italy and then internationally. 
There's obviously a long history of debates and discussions about precisely how accurate their presentation of Gramsci's thought was, what their motives or intentions uh, may have been. Um, I think often those debates have um, not given due or credit to the good faith, uh, or at least the intentions of Togliatti and, and Platone of attempting to preserve uh, their old fallen comrades' legacy. Whatever position we adopt in relation to those various debates, I think it's hard to deny that this was one of the great um, publishing initiatives of the 20th century. Um, it resulted in Gramsci's fame spreading throughout the world uh, extensively and becoming one of the major social and political theorists of the long season of the 1960s and 1970s on an international scale. It's no mean feat to achieve that type of diffusion uh, for a man's uh, work who had died in a, in a fascist prison cell or soon after his official release um, from fascist imprisonment. This figure, this old Gramsci, uh, was based upon the edition that had originally been published, a thematic grouping uh, of different writings. This figure, the old Gramsci, or Gramsci hyphen Togliatti hyphen Platone, um, still remains, I think, the, the dominant Gramsci in much contemporary discussion of his work, particularly, uh, but not only, in English. And I think we can see that in the way there have been many creative developments of uh, that particular old uh, Gramsci's insights in thematic directions, ways in which insights from that author, uh, as the author was constructed from the thematic edition, uh, has been used to analyze many different contemporary problems in different political conjunctions from the 1950s um, onwards. That's obviously an entirely valid uh, form of engagement with an historical figure and with the history of their publication but it clearly doesn't exhaust the riches of Gramsci's thought when we return uh, to them and revisit them in their particular historical uh, context um, and on the basis of a new understanding of those, those contexts and the nature of the text that Gramsci produced uh, in his imprisonment. There's obviously been a huge amount of work um, done in the Italian language discussion over the last 20 years. Um, developing uh, new ways of reading Gramsci, and I think also a substantially new uh, understanding uh, of Gramsci's uh, thought, not simply in terms of its details or some of the finer points of interpretation, but globally in terms of our overall understanding of the complexity of Gramsci's thought. There has not, however, I think it's fair to say, been a sufficient reception of those Italian language debates uh, internationally, in English, but also in, in many other languages. And this volume, I think, will go a long way to enabling uh, the greater diffusion and inter international discussion of the new uh, Gramsci. The second element, I think, is very significant uh, in this book, um, builds upon uh, this dimension. It enables a productive dialogue between some of the concerns of recent Italian discussions and many of the different types of uses to which Gramsci's thought has been put uh, in different non-Italian non contexts. It's something that um, I found quite odd in, in my own work and experiences. Um, despite Gramsci being a very well-known figure, uh, being internationally recognized and discussed, um, there tends to be a certain type of resistance to engaging fully um, with uh, Italian scholarship surrounding um, his thought, whether that's through reasons of people's linguistic capacities or their cultural sensibilities um, is not entirely clear to me. It does seem quite singular in the case of Gramsci in a way um, that perhaps is not when we come to consider other uh, major figures in the history of modern political and social thought. It would be difficult to imagine people today uh, believing it was uh, legitimate to publish um, studies of the thought of Jacques Derrida, uh, for example, uh, without engaging both with his texts uh, as written in French um, or with the extensive body of French scholarship that has grown up around it. Um, in the case of Gramsci, however, there tends to be um, could we say a more libertarian attitude taken towards some basic scholarly um, protocols. 
I uh, think that has been an unfortunate um, tendency in much Anglophone scholarship in particular, and I very much welcome uh, a return to older communist traditions of genuinely international discussion. And I think this volume provides a concrete basis uh, for establishing those dialogues uh, more extensively. As Francesca noted in some of her comments, not all of the contributors to this volume necessarily engaged with the Italian literature or indeed um, were able to, to read Gramsci's text in Italian or engage with the Italian uh, scholarship uh, surrounding, surrounding them. Nevertheless, there's a certain sensibility of an engagement with the concerns that have emerged in different national contexts and the need to build up the dialogues and to translate uh, between different um, cultural and political traditions that I think is very valuable in the way the contributions to the volume interact with each other. Um, that element, I think, uh, is really quite distinctive to this volume. It's something that I do not believe has been um, attempted in such an extensive form uh, before, certainly uh, not, not in English. There might possibly be some exceptions uh, with more Brazilian Portuguese uh, contributions. But in terms of the sort of texts that are available to us, if we're teaching Gramsci or studying Gramsci, setting texts for students to engage in, um, this text really is the, this volume really is the, the cutting edge, um, the way in which we can show to uh, younger, younger readers uh, the genuinely international uh, and translational dimension of the reception of Gramsci's thought. Um, finally, the, the third reason I think this is a very significant um, volume is that it goes a long way towards breaking down some of the oppositions that I think might have emerged between so-called thematic uh, readings of Gramsci's work, applications of some of his key concepts, and more philologically uh, oriented um, studies of the details of his texts and the historical context in which they were produced. Um, I've noted um, with some amusement um, that there has at times emerged um, the suggestion that philological readings um, have a certain uh, pedantry um, to them um, or could represent a distraction from the real business of Marxist theory, which is to get on with political analysis uh, or engagement. I understand uh, the impulses uh, behind such perspectives, but I would suggest humbly that they are politically uh, mistaken. Philology in this uh, volume is shown to be a, a powerful tool for providing new and innovative political readings of the present. I think we see very clear indications of the way in which philology has never been an end in itself, but has always been an attempt to understand the way in which the past condensed in texts relates to uh, shapes and transforms and is transformed by the type of political problems that we encounter in the present and which necessarily constitute the foundation, the very reason for our interest in attempting to understand the past that um, has contributed uh, to determining our own perspectives. This is a theme that runs uh, all throughout the book, and you'll see many very interesting analyses, attempts to develop some of Gramsci's concepts and relate them to very contemporary problems. Um, we've had references to some instances of the use of Gramsci in this volume to analyze recent events in the so-called Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution, uh, the emergence of mass process in, in Thailand, also some very interesting chapters on the relevance of Gramsci to contemporary politics in Latin America. This dimension of the book gives us a very strong sense um, of this new Gramsci, uh, to which I referred at the beginning of my remarks, as in some senses our contemporary now. That is in the same way uh, in which the old Gramsci of the Togliati Platone edition was uh, a contemporary uh, or a fellow traveler or a comrade of many struggles in the 1960s. This volume shows us the way in which the new Gramsci uh, emerging from new philological and historical techniques of reading his work can also be a, a comrade um, and a participant in our current uh, political struggles. And I think that's a, a very important concrete demonstration 
of the way in which philology is never uh, a distraction from politics, but in fact is one of the fundamental tools we have as Marxists um, to ensure that our politics are always solidly and productively historically grounded. There's another sense um, as well in which this tension between past and present runs uh, through the volume. And there are in fact a number of contributions uh, by uh, Fran Francesca, um, also by uh, Ingo, uh, a very interesting study of the theme of past and present in Gramsci's works. Uh, also Alessandro Carlucci uh, in relation to uh, linguistic questions. This theme of past and present uh, intention in a way is a sort of philosophical substrate to many of the discussions in the book, but it reaches a, a point, I think, of quite fascinating um, textual reflection on the reception and the history of the reception of Gramsci's thought. When we consider the way in which um, this book represents a sort of rereading um, of the old Gramsci's influence on many currents in contemporary um, political and social theory through the lenses of the, the new Gramsci that has been emerging from more recent studies. Particularly noticeable in the volume, I think, is the way in which um, currents in post-colonial studies and subaltern studies uh, are assessed. These were readings that were developed largely on the basis of engagement with an older thematically presented uh, Gramsci, particularly through the, the famed and important volume selections from the prison notebooks. Those readings uh, are not simply rejected as somehow mistaken uh, or misguided uh, by the younger scholars in this volume. They're instead engaged with in a productive way. There's a critical dialogue going on, showing the ways in which the type of insights that is emerging from readings of the new Gramsci being produced by philologists and historians can help us, in fact, to address many of the problems that those currents uh, in critical theory had first highlighted on the basis of their reading of the old Gramsci, um, so to speak. This means that this volume um, provides a very a critical reflection, not just on Gramsci's thought itself and its continuing um, significance, but also I think of a, a much more general problem um, in the history of critical theory, broadly conceived, uh, in the history of the development of different political ideas. And that's the problem of the way in which our interpretations and traditions of interpretations of different authors can be critically interrogated and transformed in some senses um, from within. The Operation Gramsci uh, that Togliatti and Platone masterminded in the late 1940s uh, and early 1950s has produced long historical echoes and resonances that remain profoundly uh, important today. Um, the way in which a younger generation of Gramscian scholars have demonstrated they can engage with those discussions and those debates, not in the sense of a refusal, um, but in the sense of a, a critical dialogue is I think very heartening for all of us to think about the way in which certain forms of continuity with older leftist traditions can be maintained even in the very act of us seeking to renovate them and to go beyond them to confront um, what Gramsci liked to refer to as the great and terrible world of our own very different contemporary times. Thank you very much, Peter. And if I just comment as a philologist by, I'm oh, sorry. As a philologist by training, of course, I would second any suggestion that philology is necessary for Marxists. And now, uh, finally, I give the floor to uh, Anne Shostak Sassoon. Uh, she has taught as a professor at Kingston University, Kingston upon Thames and Birkbeck at the University of London and has been a visiting professor at Carlton University in Canada, Albuk University uh, in uh, Denmark and L'Orientale in uh, Napoli and has also lectured elsewhere in Europe, the US and Mexico. And her books include Gramsci's Politics and Gramsci and Contemporary Politics and also the edited collections, approaches to Gramsci and women and the state, 
and her books and articles have been translated into many languages and of course she is also one of the contributors to this really important volume. So you have the floor. Anne. Thank you so much. Um, I just I want to say that I in, and I outlined this in my preface that I I welcome this book and I'm so encouraged as a no, not as a no longer very active and no longer very young um, academic who's worked on Gramsci. The, the endeavors, the enthusiasm, the energy of another whole generation that's engaging with Gramsci. Um, having organized or helped organize conferences and also edited volumes, um, it's an enormous amount of work. Um, it always spreads over years uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the books that come out. And um, it's just really, really exciting to see how well um, uh, Aram, Francesca, Lorenzo, and uh, Rob have have managed to to get you know to produce this book. Um, I also really am pleased uh, that it's dedicated to Joe Buttigieg, who is a very dear friend of mine, who very, very sadly died all too young and quite recently. Um, both the conference and the book do something really exciting. And that is, you find that people coming from all over the world who are early career academics have the advantage of rooting their work in their different realities, their different spaces, that very often is not just one space because many of these um, brilliant young academics have, have studied and worked in different places, but also are not being kind of pigeonholed to apply Gramsci only onto that reality. Um, this is something that has occurred to me over many, many years attending many uh, conferences. Um, there tends to be an hegemony in uh, how can I put it, the Anglophone world, let's put it like that, although I'm not familiar with, with uh, I haven't really participated in academic activities, say in, in Australia or some other places. But there's something about the hegemony of the English language and the output of academia in English that tends to present its work as the universal, and the work coming from other realities and spaces as the applied, as the particular. I'm, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing. I'm not saying this um, is always dominant, but the, uh, oh dear, let me just, let me just turn this off. I'm so sorry. Uh, let me see if I can get back to the, uh, so going back, to, can you hear me? Or have I been? Yes, yes, you can. We can. Yeah, hear I can't see you because I. This has happened once before. Um, so what we what we see in this volume is the the richness of the rep of the um, the kind of traditions and ha multiple heritages of different young academics engaging with Gramsci, considering different realities, but also presenting ideas that are advancing the overall scholarship on Gramsci. So it's not just rich because of the, um, uh, the different kind of backgrounds people are coming from, but it's also wherever you are, and it's such an interesting mo moment, the time and space at, at, at this particular uh, time um, that uh, it, it's advancing Gramscian scholarship overall. Um, I want to say a few words about the set. The, well, it's a subtitle, past and present. I, I think this is not only a category that um, organized the notes in that earlier those earlier editions that Peter was talking about. But it's absolutely essential for our thinking today, much beyond Gramsci, but also in terms of Gramsci's work itself. Um, it, 
what I mean by this is I see it on several different levels. Um, Gramsci himself, not just in terms of the kind of no, the, the notes that he put under, you know, he related to this thing. But if you think about it, he very much was not only engaged with earlier thinkers and trying to see how they could be, and I use this word on purpose, transliterated into different realities and different times. But it's always intrigued me how, at least in, in many of the key thinkers that he engages with, uh, from Machiavelli through to Marx and others, and that they too are not only looking at the past in terms of the formation of their own traditions, but they too are engaged with, with other historical moments in order to think or to ask questions about what can these earlier historical moments teach them in each of the different contexts, something that will enlighten thinking about their contemporary moment. And, and I say this in a very careful way because obviously they're not models, they're not something that can be copied, but they are something that can ins inspire, is it quite the right word, but aid the thinking our thinking into try to ask questions to help us to formulate questions about lines of continuity and lines of change and the different dynamics and the novelties of different moments in history. So I want to say that I, that I find that very, very congenial. It was mentioned about, I think it was Francesca mentioned the presumed contradictions in uh, Gramsci's thought. I think it's a mistake and she wasn't doing this, but there are some people that not only find that troubling, but also attempt to, um, again, I'm searching for the right word. Homogenize isn't quite right, but who are attempting to think about or attempting to, I don't know, sort of super rationalize Gramsci and either push aside things that don't fit in or try to incorporate them in order to find um, a system of thought that is in a sense, more or less closed. What I've always found incredibly exciting in Gramsci is how this, the, the, the the, the way in which he, what we find or we may find as contradictory actually provides a basis for fertile and creative thinkings about very thinking about very complex reality. We struggle with it. It's not easy. I mean, you can, you can think, you can bury yourself in it and emerge yourself in it. And, and come out of it thinking, you know, where am I in a sense? But it's the other, this is related to what has come up uh, several times in this discussion, is that this close study of Gramsci's notes and some of the advances that have been made, the many of the advances that are made, particularly in Italy, of kind of trying to understand how Gramsci wrote the notebooks um, and to, have a sense of this rhythm of his thought um, is, is such a wonderful, it's not a point of arrival, but a kind of starting point for a whole new generation of work on Gramsci. I was enormously struck um, in uh, 2017, uh, Gramsci died in 1937. So every 10 years, there's a, a kind of celebration of his life. Uh, in the, in the, every decade on, um, you know, in the, the year, uh, you know, a decade after he, decades after he died. And in 2017, the actual notebooks, the actual notebooks uh, came to London. They were at the Italian Institute of Culture and, and they visited other, other uh, countries and, and cities in Italy. They're normally kept in Rome. And I had no idea 
how tiny they were, how his script was so small. I mean, I always had this sense of how uh, careful he was and in his way rigorous. But I saw that and was actually with one of the contribu uh, contributors to this book, a, a, a very um, uh, much younger uh, academic in a much earlier part of his own career. And I was incredibly moved. I was absolutely incredibly moved. Um, so I think I don't have a lot more to say, but what I would, I did, I would like to just think about this. Um, the form of our discussion. I have no idea where people are 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 in this moment in time physically uh, to engage in this in this conference. Um, but it's so appropriate that we are trying to think about our different spaces, our different times, and how to make sense of of these spaces and these times. And what I hope this is a contribution to, and I'm sure it is, it's a, a congenial, a creative space to develop and share thinking which is creative, thinking which is open, but is also rigorous. So I do wanna thank the people that organized the conference who put together this volume and all the contributors as well. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Anne. Uh, I take the opportunity to mention that in the historical materialism book series, we have tried over the past years to have, to try to introduce to the English speaking world as much as possible from the current uh, worldwide literature on Gramsci both from the uh, Italian writing that has appeared uh, in the past two decades uh, uh, based on the, this historical philological approach. I could point to Guido Liguori's Gramsci's pathway, Pathways and also to uh, Giuseppe Cospito's uh, uh, The Rhythm of Thought in Gramsci, both in the historical uh, materialism book series and in Haymarket. And also, we have tried to open up, to, to bring forward translations from contributions from uh, Brazil, uh, like uh, uh, Alvaro Bianchi's book or Carlos Quintinius' book. Uh, we have, as, as already mentioned, contributions from the younger generation of Italian scholars, two of them are here, like both Francesca and uh, Lorenzo are, going, are in the book series. And I think we have and of course, we also, uh, well, it was very important the moment when Peter's Gramsci moment appeared, which was uh, responsible uh, to a large extent uh, uh, for uh, this uh, new wave of interest in Gramsci mm. and uh, in the English speaking world. So, and so that's, that's something to mention. And we have some questions, so I'll try and relay them to you, uh, just a moment. Um, okay, uh, the, first, the first question we have, and it is addressed to all the, uh, to all the speakers, I think. Uh, it is by Ralph Electro, and it says that, I read it to you. It seems to me that the greatest abuse of Gramsci in the leftish anglophone world is the misuse of the concept of organic intellectuals. Have you covered this aspect of Gramsci? This is the first question we have. We have another question from Joseph uh, Zombetti. It is addressed to Francesca, and, but I think it's also in a certain way, it's also addressed to the, to the rest of the panel. The question is, can you elaborate more on how we should examine more closely the notebooks from philological and textual criticism? In other words, why do you think such a prism is important? And can you be, can you be a bit more precise on how you think such an approach should occur? Examine rhetorical tropes, questioning narrativization, revealing dialectical tensions in linguistic clusters, etc. This is the second question we have. 
and uh, yes, and I, we also have two more questions. Uh, one is for Francesca. Could you explain Gramsci's original interpretation, Marxian thought and historical materialism into philosophy and the praxis from uh, Noemi Getty? And uh, the last question we have had so far, which is also which is addressed to the entire panel, is: Can I ask the, whether or not uh, ma this volume downplays uh, substantively methodologically or epistemologically activist engagement, popular struggle, change in the world? This is uh, a question from. Uh, from John uh, John uh, Halcroft, sorry. Uh, there is also, oh, yes, and there's also another question that just appeared. How, in the opinion of the panelists, does a new approach to Gramsci's thought help us understand the actuality in our great terrible world of the morbid symptom of Trumpism? I suppose this is a more, uh, a question uh, uh, more, Pointed towards the conjecture, it is by Gareth Jenkins. So I, I suppose we go for a first round of uh, responses. As mentioned, uh, some of the questions are from Francesca, but also I think the more general uh, question of, of, of the importance of the historical philological uh, uh, approach to Gramsci goes also to the other uh, members of the panel and. Uh, also the more general questions that go to all. So, but I suggest we start with uh, uh, Francesca, who's had a greater share of questions uh, addressed to her. So Francesca, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. So of course I can go into details and showing how, uh, how we conceive analyzing philologically Gramsci. So um, we have different aspects, as Anne also said, uh, first, difficulty we face when we deal with branches where writings is their fragmentary structure. So we don't have texts, of course, but we have uh, notes uh, which are combined in uh, notebooks. But what we know as, no as notebooks, we're not conceived as such by Gramsci or not literally as such by Gramsci. We know for instance from the philological developments uh, that he, Gramsci used to split these notebooks into two, some, sometimes even more than two notebooks, by using uh, a notebook from, from the beginning, for instance, and from the end, just uh, in order to have more space for his uh, thoughts, because he wasn't allowed to have more than four or five pieces uh, in his jail, and where pieces include both the notebooks and his books. So. He was really very limited from the physical point of view. So uh, we have to keep in mind this when we work on Gramsci. And what does it mean? It means that we don't know uh, exactly when the notes were have been written and in which order. And this is very important if we want to, to reconstruct this order and to know when the, the notes were written. It's very important if you want to catch uh, to understand the development of the so, so-called reason of thought, as we said before. And I can make an example, just to make it easier. Uh, we can think about, for instance, uh, the word totalitarian, that it is adjective, but it can be a quite controversial word, quite controversial adjective. You have to keep in mind that Gramsci does not use this adjective in, in the sense we mean today, so after an hour. So, with totalitarian, he means all embracing, so to say. But it's very interesting to say how he uh, develops his reflection on these totalitarian issues. And how can, we, how can we see this? We can see this only analyzing the textual variants we find in the notebooks. So comparing what we call in Gramscian philology, uh, the first drafts with the second drafts, or also with the um, text in unique drafts. So we can see that for reasons he uses at the very beginning this adjective totalitarian, um, applying it to historical materialism as the aim of the socialist revolution. But 
going towards the end of the notebooks, she applies it, of course, as we can, it's quite obvious, but so in the late 30s, she applies it to fascist, to the, 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 the German, the Nazi German, Germany. So it's very interesting to retrace these more, it can be very small, yes, developments, but they are significant insofar as they help us to trace uh, the change also in Gramsci's mind, so to say. And so, concretely speaking, that means to focus on the plexural variants or for reasons the way in which uh, Gramsci chooses uh, one word instead of another. It's very uh, subtle and maybe boring work and requires a lot of preparation. But of course, the instruments, the tools we have now, so the critical addiction, we have also a number of, of updated chronologies that are available online as well. They can be very, very useful. And for reasons, very useful instruments uh, for the Anglophone speakers are the tables of correspondence, which you can find on the International Gramsci Society website. Uh, with them, with these tables, you can find exactly uh, to which notes correspond uh, a certain text in the selections, which are some of the most used uh, anthologies, so to say. But yeah, I could say much more, and Peter could say much more about this. And maybe I can reply very briefly to the second question because it's a, well, it's a huge question. I, I can't really reply to this question here, but, but the, the question was about the connection between, so the Marxist philosophy and the philosophy of practice, so to say. So very shortly. A huge theme, of course. And so from my point of view, uh, a plus of this new research on Gramsci, which I'm presenting here today, relates to the uh, connection between, um, between Gramsci's thought and Marx thought as such, not just Marx, and not just Mar the Marxist tradition as a whole, in which Gramsci was, of course, embedded, but uh, his own reading of Marx, which is quite surprisingly a uh, still under investigated aspect of Gramsci's thought. And for instance, in the collection, I'm not going to talk about my essay, but you can find, for instance, the essays by Fabio Ferrazzini and one by Aaron Benson, which focus on these very carefully and they're very, very useful if you want to deepen this. But I can say more now. Thank you. Uh, who wants to also respond since the questions are also addressed to uh, the other members of the panel? So, uh, just so wave or something so that I can see you. Can Rob? You just, oh, Rob. Can... oh, Anne, Anne, yes. No, I just, this is a practical point. Because I had that unfortunate telephone call interrupting my reception of Zoom. Can you actually see me? Because I can't see you. I just want to know. Yes, we can see you fine. All right, that's fine. Um, I don't really have a, a scientific response to this, but I, I would say that the if you translate the philological into the close reading of the text and the comparison of different versions of the text and the, the possibility that we now have of the, the um, incredible work of people that have, have, have looked into this, particularly coming from Italy, but with studies available in the, at least in English and possibly in other languages, it, it absolutely gives us a, a deeper sense of how Gramsci was thinking. So for me, this is the, the huge value of all the, of that approach. I'll just leave it at that. Rob, you wanted to uh, say something? Yeah. Um... I guess, um, I mean, someone asked a question about the whether there are any chapters that cover the concept of organic intellectuals um, directly. And I guess the answer to that is many of them uh, in different ways, but not there's no single chapter which is kind of addressed to, I think, the particular sort of uh, misuse, as the, as the questioner asked, of, of the idea of the organic intellectual. Um, but I suppose I wanted to respond to that question by kind of, um, I guess, broadening out some of Peter com Peter's comments in terms of the 
um, the, the old Gramsci, the most important one being the, the sort of publishing initiative that he detailed around, around the sort of Togliatti Platone um, um, tradition, but also kind of to put alongside that and what I think comes out in, in certainly towards the end of the volume in the different readings of Gramsci is the sort of many of the other readings that were developed often in opposition and in, in, in debate with, with that reading um, so particularly I'm thinking of there's one of the chapters on Norberto Bobbio's interpretation of Gramsci um, and obviously there are, um, there is a, a very important kind of contemporary resonance in terms of another question about, about populism um, about the way in which Gramsci is used today by left populism kind of emerges from uh, a kind of uh, as a as a follow on um, from some of those debates in terms of the way the concept the concept of intellectuals and organic intellectuals is used today. So I think there are many different contributors in the um, in the volume who kind of engage with the way in which we can go back and reread concepts like the like organic and traditional intellectuals um, and see the different kind of old Gramsci's that have that that continue to exist in in contemporary and thought and debates uh, sometimes a little bit subterraneanly. So the Bobbio is one example. In fact, Peter's book on the Gramsci moment um, is a, a, a really kind of incredible uh, elaboration of two others, which is the Althusserian reading of Gramsci and, and Perry Anderson's uh, reading of Gramsci, which again connects to kind of a point Anne was making earlier about attempts to kind of uh, address this question of apparent uh, uh, oppositions within Gramscian thought, uh, and as Anne put it, to kind of uh, rationalise those, um, perhaps super rationalise those. Um, so I think the there are, in many of the later chapters on Althusser, on Bobbio, in fact also a very interesting kind of intellectual history of Gramsci's reception in France, which perhaps shows some of the ways that Gramsci's thought, through its not being published, but attempts to publish it by people like Sartre had an effect on many of the French intellectuals in the 50s and 60s in a way which we perhaps don't always see um, on the surface, but I think is important for our understanding of, of kind of Gramsci's subterranean influence as well, and, and therefore trying to trace his different uh, legacies uh, and put together for ourselves today a reading both in a philological way of uh, of his text, but also of his kind of afterlives in the present. Okay. Lorenzo, you wanted to intervene. Unmute yourself, Lorenzo. Yeah, 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 thanks. Well, thanks for uh, the, the different questions. I wanted to just uh, briefly comment uh, upon the last one that has been asked on how a particular reading or this rereading of Gramsci can help us to understand the current situation just in I mean methodologically to make an example I mean you can have an approach that uh, or a concept that might help, help us to understand the current situation might be uh, the concept of organic crisis no uh, and this is um, maybe a concept that has been analyzed uh, usually from just from the super superstructural uh, level no without taking into account all the structural elements that uh, Gramsci actually takes into account for uh, uh, when when exploring uh, that uh, idea and concept. So this is perhaps a way in which you, you might not just look at uh, I don't know the crisis of legitimacy or the separation of political society and civil society uh, and so on in order to understand the the current crisis, but but uh, that when you have a reading that also leads you to uh, to um, take into account more structural uh, analysis related to the economy, to the law of value, and even to the importance of Marxist capital in order to understand uh, <clears throat> the sort of uh, its crisis and, uh, and 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 so on. So this is just uh, an example, I guess. Uh, in which this reading that, that, that we attempt to uh, foster might, might, might be uh, helpful. 
and also uh, just also a very brief comment there was another question whether we also have uh, contributions that attempt to analyze the um the importance of social movements and so on and there i would say that um uh, we have a, a whole section on subalternity and so on which might be very interesting to read uh, from that perspective uh, if i could come in patty this just to comment on on a few yes, of the yes. questions yes you can um, yeah, just to uh, John Charlecraft um, regarding the, the nature of the volume and if it um, downplays or not um, issues of, of political engagement. I think one of the, the fascinating things about the volume is that in some ways uh, it looks a little bit like Gramsci's prison notebooks themselves. There aren't quite as many pages in this volume, but the composition of it um, is similar to the prison notebooks in the sense that there are some texts focused directly on quite concrete political issues, other texts reflecting um, on, let's say, more theoretically removed issues, some texts focusing on uh, historical questions, other on theoretical questions and so forth. So there's a range of different uh, approaches here, but for the reader interested in what can Gramsci tell me about contemporary politics, there's a, a range of texts on issues from politics in Latin America to Gramsci's relevance to analyzing the migrant crisis in contemporary Europe uh, to transformations in global political economy, um, which I think it become even more interesting when read in the context of the volume, when they're accompanied by fascinating texts that will focus, as Rob's text does, for example, focused on um, the question of the mummification of, of culture as a concept in Gramsci's thought and the way these different approaches play off each other. Um, so I find that a very enriching way of trying to reflect not just on the theoretical issues, but also the, the political or the more directly activist questions with which the book engages. I wanted to comment briefly on the question of how can Gramsci and a new approach to Gramsci help us to understand Trumpism um, and everything that goes along with us. Um, by noting two elements. To pose that sort of question, how can any thinker from the past help us to understand the present, is necessarily to pose this question of tensions between past and present. And there's a number of important contributions um, here. Francesca's text focuses explicitly on the role of historical um, analogy in, in Gramsci's thinking and in the broader Marxist um, tradition. Um, and helps us to think through what we're doing when we're in trying to engage and reactivate previous thinkers um, from different political traditions as a way of comprehending the way the present is operating. Substantively, I would suggest that Gramsci is particularly relevant for understanding the type of organic crisis um, from which Trumpism has emerged. Um, the crisis in the hegemony of the contemporary ruling classes um, who are searching around desperately trying to find some way to stabilize um, and govern and regulate um, the very contradictory and uneven accumulation processes that have set in chain. Um, Grabshi's analysis of fascism, um, as we're seeing from, from new studies on this topic, based upon digging back through his notebooks in the historical context, is I think much more um, sophisticated and refined than we perhaps Used to, um, used to suspect. I'm not saying that new findings fundamentally contradict previous discussions we've had, but they certainly add many new layers of, of complexity. And when those dynamics are read in relation um, to work that's emerged inspired by different currents of contemporary critical theory, such as subaltern studies, I think we get a very powerful reflection upon the nature of bourgeois liberal parliamentary democracies uh, and regimes, and their capacity for producing subalternizing relationships and political structures um, between different class and, and broader social group projects. There isn't an immediate analysis of Trumpism that emerges out of that, and Gramsci would be the last person to suggest that we take his analysis of the historical causes and reasons for the emergence of fascism in Italy and use it as a sort of template to read off the emergence of Trumpism. But thinking through the depth and the complexity of Gramsci's analysis of fascism, how far back he goes into history to think through all the dynamics that are operating there. If we're looking for an example of 
how we need to approach the analysis of Trumpism, how we need to think through all of these many contradictions in our own time, it seems to me a very good historical exemplar of the way in which critical revolutionary theory and practice needs needs to be conducted. Could I come in here on yes, uh, yes, on, I'm... on um, uh, I can absolutely endorse what Peter says and said. Um, I think something that is very very strong in Gramsci is not to see. Uh, whatever label we call, whatever label we use or, or uh, concept we use, subaltern so ca classes, um, laboring classes, uh, people who are not um, um, hegemonic, uh, he never sees them as victims. Um, he he wants to understand. He always wants to understand why people accept different kinds of ideas. What is it in their um, sort of pre-existing uh, traditions that have influenced people in uh, diverse ways to, to possibly encourage them to um, accept certain ideas. But he's also very interested in why are people resistant to what he or others would see as very progressive ideas. And this is where he uses concepts like um, good sense and common sense. And he uses an example, and his notebooks are filled with these, these kind of examples, either from things he's reading or um, uh, his own experiences, but one that has always struck me, and this is, this is very indirectly related to Trumpism or to um, uh, uh, support, popular support for political positions that people may not um, uh, agree with. He, he looks at, he examines why people, let's say an Italian village in, in Southern, for the sake of argument, Southern Italy, a moment probably when many of the people are not, um, or a good proportion of particularly older people may not even be literate. Um, why do they hang on to small C conservative ideas? You know, I know what I know, this is my reality and they're impervious to counter arguments. I think we've all had this experience in different ways um, in, in different places. And it's because I get, you know, the, the fact is that they, people, other people of more uh, refined education, of, of uh, more years in education or more articulate, be it the local notable, uh, you know, the influential person or the priest, or indeed a teacher, they can, people can articulate different ideas, but today there's one articulate presentation of an argument and tomorrow there's another. And so people hold on to what they, they know and that's within quotation marks or inverted commas because it reflects something in their lived reality. And, and he's, he's always trying to engage into, with what is it that, um, what are the roots of people's beliefs and indeed activities without blaming them or accusing them or diminishing them? And I think this is such an important moment um, to, to learn, for us to learn that lesson right now. And it isn't just, uh, I mean, for me personally, it would also be with regards to aspects of, of of Britain and different parts of British society, and uh, personally for the, the the vote, for example, to um, leave the European Union. So I think it's a that's a really profound thing that we who may have different positions in society um, have to have to really engage with. And if I could go back to the organic intellectuals and how it's how the terms misused, it's not just organic intellectuals. A lot of a lot of concepts in Gramsci that are used in many, many different ways. But I think what we we have to kind of, this is where the, going back to Gramsci, reading him and engaging in, Gramsci, use that word again, with in Gramsci's uh, writings, um, his own double or multiple uses of, of terminology. And rather than see that as dumbfounding or confusing, or can be confusing, 
Um, I've always seen that, for example, the use of state, even the, the use of hegemony, the use of civil society, uh, political society. I think what he's grappling there with is that the actual concrete reality is multifaceted, varied, and not just contradictory, but the difficulty we have in describing it using traditional terminology. And I think it's really significant in Gramsci. He doesn't invent a different word to intellectual. He doesn't invent a different word, a new terminology with regard to uh, the state or political society or civil society. He, it's a decision to stick with that terminology. And it, of course, in certain points, he, he does use a, a terminology which is not as familiar, philosophy of praxis. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, um, but I think that a sensitivity, for example, is used in that sense is use of language can, can um, if not explain Gramsci or explain contemporary reality, it can help us to sort of uh, ponder the complexity of, of, of any moment in time. And I, I'll leave that, I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot, Anne. And we have uh, a second set of uh, questions that I'm going to pose to you, I've, I've, which have also been, uh, which have also been uh, post, uh, pasted to you, so you can read them. So the questions are the following. Uh, the first question is, the concept of the integral state is one of Gramsci's key contributions to political science, as Peter Thomas highlighted very innovatively in his Gramscian moment. Does this volume explore it? It is a question from Antonio Pelaez. The second question is for our, from, our, uh, from Mikko Lachtinen from Finland. Uh, I'd like to hear your ideas how to continue translation work of Buddhist critical edition of the prison notebooks. This is the second question. The third uh, question is from Julian Townsend, and it is, could someone on the panel say something about who Gramsci uh, uh, was, had internal dialogues with when writing the prison notebooks? Uh, the fourth question is for Peter. It's from Alessandra Marti. I'd like to know by Peter, who are the good subalterns and how the old Gramscian concept has changed today. It's a reference to his contribution in the volume. And the final question is uh, from, uh, well, not the final, we have also another one, by uh, Sobhanlal uh, Datagupta. And the question is, is there any new material now available on Gramsci Comintern relationship especially the letter sent by Gramsci on behalf of the Italian Communist Party uh, to, the, uh, to the Bolshevik Party regarding Stalin's suppression of the opposition. And uh, there's also another question from Peter Ives. Uh, with this new uh, interaction, with this new Zoom interaction, I recall Gramsci's image of Tia Elena in Bicicleta so I wonder how Gramsci's take on the non-techno-determinism by technology might appear in this uh, revisiting. That's uh, a question from Peter Ives. So, which I'm also pasting for you to read. So who wants to comment on this set of uh, questions or to some of these questions who would like to start from the panel? Um, any Zoom silences are equally, you know, uh, uneasy as uh, live panels uh, silences. Okay, Francesca, and then Rob. So maybe I can say something about the uh, the question on the uh, on the letters on the sources. Well, um, doesn't directly relate to the collected volume, but uh, it had been released. Um, a few weeks ago, a new edition of Gramsci's Letters, edited by Francesco Giazzi, who is director of the Gramsci Foundation in Rome. And I think, I didn't see the book yet, but I 
I think it contains also new material in the Gramsci community relationship. Uh, he has been working for many years on uh, collecting new material from the Russian archives. So maybe this could be included in this new edition, in this new edition which will be the basis also for the critical, the, the national uh, critical edition of the year. Gramsci's writings I was mentioning in my short presentation. Maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe that's that's an option. I can uh, look closer into it. Rob, I think you had raised your hand um, also. Okay, so who wants also to comment on this series of uh, questions? Some of them are for Peter. Um, yeah, just to come in on the uh, Miko's question regarding uh, continuation of Joe uh, Buttigieg's critical edition of the prison notebooks in English. Um, before he died, Joe had been working um, with uh, Marcus Green um, on a, a special edition of uh, the notebook on subaltern social groups, the history of subaltern social groups. And that is scheduled, it might have already appeared um, with, with Columbia. Um, and then there are ongoing discussions and plans um, uh, for establishing a, a group to uh, continue the production of the full critical edition um, in English. Joe's uh, edition, the work he was able to do, got up to notebook eight. Um, there's obviously quite a, a number of notebooks notebooks remaining, but hopefully that project will um, pick up some steam over the coming years. Of course, if anyone knows any funding bodies who like granting money for those activities, um, it's always good to share, share the knowledge. Um, regarding... Um, the question of uh, from Alexandra, uh, who are the good subalterns? Um, in my chapter in the book, uh, I tried to explore that notion of subalternity um, in dialogue with um, initiatives in subaltern studies, but also looking to extend them in some ways. The original uh, work by Guha and others in the subaltern studies collective was, I think, incredibly uh, creative, um, really valorizing a concept in Gramsci that had often been neglected um, before their work. Um, and indicating the way in which it could be stretched or extended and used um, in very different contexts. There was a, a certain um, downside uh, to that valorization. I think in general critical theoretical discussions, there emerged a sort of tendency to think of the subaltern as a figure primarily relevant um, to the, the colonial world, uh, to the peasantry. Um, when we go back and look at Gramsci's notebooks in the light of the experience of subaltern studies, um, we can begin to see that actually the term is much more central to his whole political theory than many had previously suspected, but also that this term of subalternity is not simply relevant, um, as it were, to the, the wretched of, of the earth, um, and certainly should not be limited to the peasantry, but is a general characterization of forms of political functioning um, in the modern world. And it's a key that can help us to analyze all the forms of subaltern relations that dominate so-called advanced Western liberal parliamentary democracies, just as much as it can be used to, to analyze forms of colonial uh, and post-colonial uh, oppression and domination. So I, I'd like to suggest that re returning to Gramsci's conception of a continuum of relations of subalternity, um, we can start to think of the way in which his vocabulary of subalternity in fact constitutes a very profound challenge to the entire liberal discourse around notions of citizenship, um, of rights, and the whole uh, range of, of concepts that liberal political theory has developed. We have an alternative vocabulary that I think provides a much more concrete analysis of the forms of oppression and exploitation and domination and the way they all uh, intersect emerging from that line of Gramscian analysis than we can find, I think, in many discussions um, in contemporary political philosophy. And here I include also many currents um, in leftist and, and critical um, political philosophy. Gramscian's perspective can really uh, renew those debates. Um, and just regarding finally on the Gramscian common turn um, relationship, um, after I actually have some meetings with collaborator Craig uh, Brandist, um, Soon we've been working for some time uh, based on some archival work uh, in Russia as well, and we'll be looking to publish a volume. Um, hopefully it will be out next year in the HM series, um, looking at uh, some of the uh, documents from Gramsci's uh, time in, in Russia in, in the early 20s as well. Um, and I know from 
some of the recent Italian publications and the work that we've been doing, um, that entire experience of Gramsci's engagement with the Comintern, his, his stay in Russia, was so fundamental to so many dimensions of his thought that gathering and having available more materials, I think, will help us to finally put to bed this old notion that Gramsci in some way represents um, an alternative to, or perhaps an opposition to the Russian revolutionary experience. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, he represents a type of organic con continuation um, and imminent critique of the main themes that emerged in the Russian revolutionary process. Thanks a lot, Peter. Anyone else who wants to comment on the questions uh, we've had so far? Yes, Lorenzo. Mute myself. No, thanks. Just very briefly um, regarding the, the, the question on technology and the integral uh, state. Uh, the issue of technology um, is actually addressed by a chapter by Bruno Settis, no, which is a very interesting chapter. So I wanted just to refer to that one. And the issue of the integral state is also discussed, not as a specific chapter, but it runs to different chapters. It was all only what I wanted to add concerning the, the questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. Anyone else? Rob? And um, yeah, I guess so to touch on and maybe not totally answer, but kind of connect two of the questions. The, the question of the integral state that Lorenzo just mentioned is, of course, uh, one example among many of, of ways in which, um, you know, another way of putting that is, uh, I think, by Butchie Glucksmann, uh, is the extended conception of the of the state and Gramsci's extension of concepts, whether that be the intellectual, the state, um, or in many other ways, are kind of examples of, I think, what Anne was talking about earlier in terms of the way in which Gramsci takes up um, concepts um, used by others, um, engages in a kind of de debate and confrontation with them and, and finds in many ways new ways uh, of using them. And, and that kind of brings me to the to connect that question to Jules Townsend's question about, you know, what kind of internal dialogue was Gramsci having when writing the prison notebooks? I'm not sure whether Jules meant that in terms of internal to prison, who was he in dialogue with internal to the party, or the way I'm going to twist it and choose to respond to it is a internal to the sort of world of theoretical references um, that he was engaged with, because I think one of the things that comes out for me most strongly of this new way of kind of working and approaching Gramsci um, with the with the historical philological method is that it kind of increasingly reveals to you the multifaceted and kind of multi-level dialogues that are going on within the prison notebooks in which Gramsci often when you kind of start to work back through the other figures that he's been in dialogue. I mean, the latest one that's kind of increasingly become obvious to me is the, the elite theorists, people like Wilfredo Pareto and Gaetano Mosca. Um, when you kind of look at the language they use about um, equilibrium, about the idea of the political formula, and you see the way in which Gramsci takes up that language and incorporates it into his own constellation of concepts within the philosophy of praxis, which is obviously an architecture that runs right through up to this idea of the integral state. Um, you can see the ways in which he's taking the latest kind of developments in, in and beyond uh, Marxist, uh, Marxist thought um, and retooling them for his own purposes. So he talks about the political formula concept of, of Moscow's of the, of the United Front, uh, taking that in a, in a very, you know, and so those discussions often we kind of look over them as a sort of odd formulation of a particular term. Oh, it's odd that Gramsci hasn't said it in the kind of very cliche way in which we normally think about it. Um, but actually has all of those internal dialogues resonating with them. And I think it's, only in a volume like this, where you have people exploring Gramsci's ideas in all these different manifold contexts and applications, and also working back through the philology of those, and um, that I think the full richness of these of these writings and the, and the legacy that he left behind um, actually becomes apparent to us. And, and that all works itself together to provide a richer idea of the philosophy of praxis, which can then be um, 
allow us to engage and hopefully transform the world um, in more in more powerful uh, ways that are, are less uh, likely to be caught up in in perhaps pitfalls and um, uh, repeating pitfalls of the past. Could I come in briefly, which is yes, yes. Um, it isn't directly uh, connected, but it is it is linked to much of what we've been talking about. Something that's always fascinated me in Gramsci is how he will take the smallest bit of information. And I'm thinking of a, a, a he's he's reading the review of a, a book or he's taking some little, little uh, 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 bit of, of insight somewhere from, it's not so much as an insight to be followed, but it takes it then to allow himself, he jumps from that to, to, to make use of it to help him think about, you know, to develop his own thoughts. So in a way there's something in his approach. Now, heaven forbid we should ever, any of us um, in this Zoom meeting uh, face the kind of constraints he did in prison or ill health and, and so on. But he, it's a very, very cr creative process. And it isn't the only way, but I think I just, I would just say it's kind of an encouragement to allow us to roam freely in our thoughts and our imaginations to, when we come across something that's intriguing. And all the more, if it's something that is counterintuitive, that kind of jolts us out of taken for grantedness about um, some aspect of how we're living or how we assume um, other people in our societies are living. Um, so there's a kind of uh, both creative uh, and oddly he's, he's, complete, he's absolutely restricted. And yet in his, imagine, his creative imagination, he isn't. And I, I find it that has always been enormously inspiring. Thanks a lot, Anne. As far as I can see in, in the chat, uh, in the YouTube chat, we don't have any other questions, although uh, the persons that asked the questions and got the responses have thanked you. I will, you will see these thanks later. I will relay them to you. Uh, I don't know if you have any other, you know, uh, final comments or any anything to add could i just, could I just say hello oh. to Mika in finland who's a very old friend <laughs> yes francesca i just wanted to uh, thank you all the contributors and i want to say that as conference organizers we've been very lucky to have so many participants we have a, a great choice of uh papers at the conference and we could choose the, some of them and it was really nice that in spite of um, having organized a conference on the basis of a call for, for, for papers we were able to create I think such a coherent edited volume so in my opinion all the different chapters connect very well with, to each other and so we have really to thank you the contributors for having uh, spent a lot of time uh, rewriting their chapters and so it was really a great thought from them and so they really part of this this book so thank you very much okay so oh peter yes yeah if i could just come in and say um one further word of congratulations um to the editors um perhaps also um some suggestions for for, for others out there listening or, or watching today as I said at the start, I think one of the really inspiring things about this book is that it's not just a book. Um, this is a whole organic research process. Um, this is built up through the hard labor of contacting people, of talking, of developing dialogues, um, of working over a long number of years. And in many respects, I think this book provides a real model example of precisely what the historical materialism tries to do and has been trying to do for, for over 20 years to build up this sense of a sort of Marxist public sphere um, where we can valorize the, the, the legitimacy of our own scholarship and our own scholarly uh, communities 
and use that to develop um, dynamic collective projects of incredibly high quality. Um, for those of you who are engaged in academia in its various forms, um, you'll be aware that the intellectual environment in many institutions uh, these days is much more strongly directed by various managerial decrees uh, and metrics um, and a real absence of that sense of scholarly community. But it's incredibly inspiring for me, um, the work the editors have done here concretely of demonstrating that we don't have to suffer in silence. Um, as Marxists, we can reach out in our international networks and build up those types of rewarding dialogues um, and collaborations. So a final pitch um, then, uh, I suggested Gramsci could be an exemplar for us today grappling with many of our problems. I think the editors of this volume also can be looked upon um, as exemplars um, of the types of projects we should be encouraging and enabling uh, on the left today. So if anyone else there out there is working on different projects around different Marxist thinkers, different Marxist topics, the historical materialism book series is always very interested to hear from you um, and provide the support to help you also undertake a, a similar type of journey and keep developing that broader critical dialogue. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the participants in this panel, thank them not only for this panel, thank, thank them for their contribution in this very, really important volume, which is available in the historical materialism book series and soon in the Haymarket uh, version of the, of the historical materialism book series. Uh, again, I'd like to urge you uh, who are watching to support the historical material and project because it enables the production of such theoretical contribution. This means please do subscribe to the journal and get a thousand pages of uh, you know important Marxist theory, theoretical contributions. It's gear. Get your institutions to subscribe to the historical materialism book series and get the volumes for the university libraries and check out Haymarket for the uh, affordable editions of the historical materialism book series that appear one year after the publication of its volume at Brill. And in difficult yet challenging times like this, do engage with Gramsci. Uh, it is a laboratory, not just a thinker, but in this laboratory, you will find real uh, points to make you think and also to inspire you to actually comprehend this uh, terrible world, but also a world that it is possible to change. So thank you all very much and a good evening for all of you.